It was only yesterday that the tracks of the iron horse laced all through the Colorado Rockies. Twisting, curving, and stretching ever upward, these marvels of railroad engineering link the mountain boom towns with the world outside. Today, most of the high routes are long abandoned, their rails and fittings removed, their grades and tunnels often converted to highway use. Until very recently, the iron horse was left all but homeless, with scarcely any place to run. The ghosts of the real old-time railroad men, now long gone, haunt the modern historian, demanding that we remember the thrilling stories of their glorious era. Robert Richardson and Cornelius Houck have responded to those ghosts. In 1958, they opened the Colorado Railroad Museum near the town of Golden. Here, the spirit of the rails lives on. Co-founder Bob Richardson explains his feeling of urgency in establishing the museum. And it uh, was brought on by the uh, Denver Rio Grande Western abandoning much of its lines and the connecting Rio Grande Southern Railroad totally abandoning about in 1951. I couldn't say the whole railroad because there were hundreds of miles of line involved, dozens of locomotives and hundreds of cars. So I could just sort of uh, sample it, you might say. And that's what we have here today. This is a new home for the old-time railroad men, a place where their marvelous stories live again in photos, exhibits, memorabilia, and most important of all, in rolling stock and traction lines. These original tracks and fittings came from the old, long-abandoned lines, and they were laid here by volunteers. Real buffs come from miles around on those weekends when old number 346 is brought out and exercised. Occasionally, even a fabled galloping goose warms the cold tracks. The museum owns three very distinctive models of the goose, which are rebuilt gasoline-powered vehicles, relics from the Great Depression of the 1930s, when the railroads couldn't afford to run steam-powered trains. These vehicles originally ran the rails from Dolores to Ridgeway, a 200-mile round trip, carrying freight, mail, and a few passengers.
public enthusiasm for the old mountain trains is reviving. Colorado now boasts sections of three famous old narrow-gauge railroads operating in four highly scenic locations. These excursion lines give their passengers a taste of what it used to be like here in the mountains long ago. The running of these old timers recalls a history that almost didn't happen. The full story of most of the working railroads of the Colorado Rockies spans little more than a century. It's an endlessly fascinating drama of tragedies and triumphs played out in a spectacular mountain setting. A setting that proved to be both magnificent and heartbreaking. In America in the 1850s, the magical name California was on everybody's lips, and expansionism was the nation's slogan. Railroads already provided regular service in the east. However, few miles of track had yet to be built west of the Mississippi River. As early as 1848, John Charles Fremont set out to find a clear railroad pass over the Continental Divide in Colorado. He recklessly tackled the Rockies in the dead of winter, a foolhardy and disastrous quest that cost the lives of 10 of his men. Fremont's expedition arrived here at Bent's Fort in mid-November, 1848. Experienced mountain men told him his plan was crazy, and they refused to act as his guide. Fremont pressed on, hired legendary Bill Williams to guide him, and pushed up into the snow-choked peaks. The group was trapped by a blizzard at an elevation of 12,000 feet. Men froze or starved to death. The survivors, reduced to eating insects, were at last rescued by a band of Ute Indians. Fremont's appalling failure did nothing to further the cause of railroad construction through the central Rockies, but he had clearly proved that here, both climate and topography were brutal tyrants. The Western railroads were born during the Civil War, when President Lincoln signed the Pacific Railroad Bill in 1862. The climax of decades of exploration and feverish years of construction came on May 10, 1869 at Promontory, Utah. Here, the golden spike was driven into place, marking the completion of the railroad to California. But its route was around, not through the Colorado Rockies. Three years later, in 1872, the Denver Pacific Railroad connected the territory's capital with the transcontinental line at Cheyenne. However, Colorado's formidable mountain barrier was not substantially penetrated by any rail line for nearly another decade. The 1870s saw the rise of other railroads in Colorado, most of them built to serve the coal fields and the gold and silver mines. Prominent among these early railroads was the Denver and Rio Grande, destined to become the most extensive system in Colorado. Its narrow three-foot gauge tracks were an innovation for public railroads in North America. Eventually, because this new narrow gauge offered greater economy and easier construction, it was adopted by other lines as they expanded westward into the mountains. Railroad construction in Colorado reached its height in the 1880s and early 1890s. Total mileage more than tripled during that period. Then the state's big railroad boom came to an end. At the close of the 19th century, there were scores of different lines using somewhere around 1,500 locomotives in building the thriving Colorado Empire. During the expansion period of the 80s, the Denver and Rio Grande, which was originally 100% narrow gauge, had launched an extensive conversion program. Standard gauge equipment was accommodated either by widening the distance between the rails or by adding a third rail to existing trackage. By 1891, standard gauge rolling stock could travel all DNRG main lines and many of its branches. But it was the narrow gauge that first conquered the Rockies. 
And today it's the narrow gauge that fascinates visitors to Colorado and rail fans everywhere. The DNRG Railroad is the parent of two modern excursion lines. The Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad, connecting those two historic old towns, and the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad along Colorado's border with New Mexico. The D and RG was founded by General William Jackson Palmer, a Civil War hero who dreamed of a railroad empire based on a line between Denver and Mexico City. Late in 1870, Palmer began laying narrow gauge tracks southward from Denver. This is his depot at Palmer Lake. He founded Colorado Springs and continued on. South of Pueblo, Palmer entered country that the Santa Fe Railroad considered its territory, and an actual war broke out between the two competing lines. To avoid continuing confrontations with the Santa Fe in New Mexico, Palmer considered alternative routes. The prosperous mining town of Silverton, deep in the San Juan Mountains of southwestern Colorado, suggested a profitable operation. Silverton's mining claims were already well known to investors from Denver to Boston to London. The numerous veins of the district were pouring forth uncountable riches, and plodding borough trains and freight wagons simply couldn't move the ore fast enough. Palmer's DNRG founded the town of Durango, 45 miles to the south, where there were coal deposits to fuel the smelters needed for the rich Silverton ore. Palmer committed himself to Silverton, to the long, spectacular stretch of tracks that came to be called the San Juan Extension. He pushed his line westward to the tiny settlement of Antonito. From here, he had to circle around south of the San Juans and into New Mexico via the Toltec Gorge and the Cumbres Pass to the adobe village of Chama. Today, this section between Antonito and Chama is all that's left of the old Cumbres Pass route. Passenger service ended here in 1951, and in 1967, the D and RG wished to abandon the entire section west of Antonito. There was a loud public outcry demanding the preservation of at least part of the San Juan extension as an excursion line. The legislatures of both Colorado and New Mexico created joint railroad authorities, and in 1970, they purchased the highly scenic 64-mile section between Antonito and Chama. Two years later, the historic trackage of the renamed Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad was opened for tours. Today, during the summer, there are two trains daily on this route. At about the same time, every morning, one leaves from each end of the line, both heading for a lunch rendezvous together at the town of Osher. Passengers are offered several options of one- and two-day trips. After boarding at Andonito, we head southwest over the lava-capped mesa. There are few man-made intrusions here, and suddenly you realize the scene predates the train, predates even Colorado. This was the land of the Conquistadors, and the oldest settlements in the state are close by at San Luis, Conejos, and La Jara. Soon our locomotive is struggling to gain the elevation of the ridge leading past Bighorn Peak. Our first stop is for water at Sublet, New Mexico. At its peak, this place was home for a gang of section workers, and a siding here provided a rail outlet for a flourishing lumber industry.
Five miles beyond Sublet is the first of two tunnels. This one is known as Mud Tunnel, a never-ending source of problems for the Rio Grande. The name comes from the soft volcanic ash here that slides when wet. Near this place in February 1948, an avalanche roared down the cliffs of Toltec Gorge, tore three cars off the end of a laboring Denver and Rio Grande western train, and hurled them over the lip of the canyon. The horrified occupants of the coaches somehow survived the 200-foot fall, and this fact was accepted as just one more dramatic incident in the amazing history of this line. Our train continues the ascent to the second tunnel. This is famous Rock Tunnel, a spectacular engineering achievement 600 feet above the Toltec Gorge and the Rio de los Pinos. The name Toltec is believed to come from the Nahuatl Indian tribes of Mexico, a carryover from General Palmer's original dream of extending his line that far south. Our lunch stop will be at the old railroad town of Osier, where the two excursion trains of the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad meet. So far, our train has been traveling west from Antonito. Chama, New Mexico is now the western terminus of the Cumbres and Toltec, and the location of its headquarters. The second train starts its daily run from here. Chama's historic old railroad buildings Roundhouse, Water Tower, Depot, Sand House, and Coal Tipple are fascinating testimony to the town's importance on the old D and RG line. This place is a photographer's dream. There's an enormous variety of rail equipment in the yard, as well as a lumber mill, stock pens and chutes, and oil loading racks. Here at Chama, by the way, lucky rail fans are able to see an authentic double header in use on those runs when the number of cars requires two engines. Between here and Cumbre Summit, there are about 15 miles of 4% grade. Our eastbound train leaves Chama and heads toward the lunch rendezvous with the Antonito train at Osier. At Lobato siding, there are stock loading facilities and a depot named Weed City, along with a fake water tank that was built by a movie studio in 1970. Colorado's old railroads have been used in filming many westerns. So that the legal load limit of Lobato trestle will not be exceeded, the first engine is uncoupled and crosses alone. Once the second locomotive is crossed, the two engines are recoupled and our double header resumes its uphill labors. The Lobato Trestle is the largest bridge on the San Juan extension. Smoke pours from the stacks as the engines negotiate the sharp curves and steepening slopes. These scenes of the double header were filmed in the fall, and snow has already come to the high country here. In our climb to Cundre's summit, we get up to a little over 10,000 feet above sea level. Near Windy Point, our train passes through some of the most spectacular scenery of the trip. The second engine is then dropped here at Cumbre Summit, and our train continues on toward Osier.
In the early years of the DNRG, a number of people lived here at Cumbres year-round, and the present Cumbres and Toltec station was originally a section house. Tanglefoot Curve is just east of Cumbres. Years ago, when this line was part of the Denver and Rio Grande Western's commercial operation, trainmen liked to get off the caboose here, scramble up the slope, and climb onto the locomotive of the same train. Our train from Chama has already reached the station at Osier when the Antonito train pulls in and breaks smoothly to a stop on the siding next to us. Osier, Colorado was originally the site of a toll gate on the old San Juan Road before the railroad came through. The Rio Grande built a small depot, a water tank, and a dining hall and bunkhouse for the section gangs. Food is available in the old dining hall, the same building that has stood here since 1885. Tables are also set up outdoors. Osier is much more than just a midday stop for lunch, however, or a station where you can change trains. It's a place where rail enthusiasts from both trains can meet in fellowship to compare notes and swap stories. But pause for a moment. Lend your ear to the soft mountain breeze. Perhaps you'll catch the ancient ring of hammer on steel or hear the faint voices echoing back from a hundred years ago, calling us out once again along the shining rails. Long before General Palmer's line reached Durango, other Colorado railroad magnets were also pushing steel tracks into the mountain fastnesses. My name is Loveland, William A. H. Loveland. I first came to Colorado back in 1859 and opened up a general store in a little town called Golden, which I helped found. Prospectors were swarming into the area, and pretty soon a lot of rich veins of both silver and gold were discovered way up Clear Creek Canyon, around Georgetown, about 35 miles above Golden. The miners needed a way better than the hazardous mountain roads to carry supplies in and bullion out. And that's when I got the idea for the railroad. When my friend Ed Burford, he was an engineer from Switzerland, I built a standard gauge line into Denver to connect with the Transcontinental Railroad. We signed a contract with the Union Pacific for money and supplies to build a spur line up the canyon to Georgetown and Silver Plume and the other mining towns up there. I wanted standard gauge here also so that it would be compatible with the other lines in Colorado. But Ed convinced me that the three foot wide narrow gauge track would be better in the mountains. He was right too. Construction was going fine when the panic of 1873 just about shut us down. I got some more financial help from Jay Gould who ran the UP. Although Gould left me in charge, our little Colorado Central was swallowed up. But at least we completed the line to Georgetown. Our first train chugged into Georgetown on August 13, 1877. Soon after that, a big new silver bonanza was found at Leadville. And we began thinking of extending our lines over the mountains from Georgetown to the new boom town. But the route just above Georgetown was impossible. The track would have to climb over 600 feet in two miles, a 6% grade. Too steep for any locomotive. And the canyon here was too narrow for switchbacks. One of the UP's engineers, 
Bob Blickensdorfer, came up with a unique solution to the problem. Following his plan, the grade would be only about 3%. The track would circle around, climbing steadily and pass over itself, crossing the lower tracks on a spectacular 95-foot high bridge. This was the Georgetown Loop. The bridge came to be called the Devil's Gate Viaduct. It was early in 1884 that the first train crossed the bridge and pulled into Silverfield. We never did get to Leadville. That idea turned out to be hopeless. But the Georgetown Loop and the Devil's Gate Viaduct were among the most popular attractions in the state, and other mountain lines seemed pale by comparison. That railroad from Denver to Silver Plume was called Colorado Scenic Wonder, just about the most famous line in the country. By the way, in 1885, the fare was just $3.45. The mining boom gradually played out, and more and more, it was passenger service that kept the line alive. Ah, oh, well, I'm glad I wasn't here to see the end. We had a small but a mighty and marvelous railroad here for a while. I'm content to remember our Colorado Central the way it used to be. After Mr. Loveland's death, automobiles became the popular way to travel. The last train passed over the original Georgetown Loop in 1939, and the splendid Devil's Gate Bridge was torn down for scrap. But thanks to the Colorado Historical Society, that was not the end of the Colorado Central Railroad. Late in the 1950s, the Society determined to develop the Georgetown Loop Historic Mining Area to tell the story of 19th century mining and railroading in the state. In the Morrison Center here, an audio-visual program provides a fine introductory survey of this fascinating era. As if the ghostly voices of the old-time railroad men had been heard in the most unexpected quarters, help came to the society in 1974. The Naval Reserve's Construction Battalion, needing work for their summer exercises, volunteered to rebuild the Georgetown Loop and the Devil's Gate Bridge. Several railroads donated money and materials, and the Historical Society undertook the search for suitable rolling stock. All these diverse efforts were crowned with success when the new Georgetown Loop opened to the public in the summer of 1975. reconstructed Devil's Gate Bridge was put into service. Now, 100 years and more after the original bridge was opened, trains are once again making this spectacular passage. Visitors can get off the train and enjoy a guided tour of the shafts and tunnels of the famous old Lebanon silver mine. At Silver Plume, a new engine house has been constructed, and the handsome old train station has been restored. Mr. Loveland would feel right at home here, and very proud.
In the great days of the railroads, everyone's life was virtually regulated by the steaming, smoking giants that roared along the tracks of steel, carrying people and goods from one place to another. For business or pleasure, you arranged your schedule to suit that of the trains. You, the men anyway, probably know me already. The name's Jenny LaRue. I'm in the hospitality business. <laughs> Ain't that a classy name for it? I'm from Cripple Creek, and I want you to know that was one hell of a town in its boom times. Oh, I suppose it doesn't look like much now, maybe, but it was Cripple Creek Gold that built them fancy homes and them ritzy downtown buildings in Colorado Springs. And when some of them uppity city fellers used to come up here, <laughs> uh, they weren't so uppity, oh, I could tell you. Cripple Creek got its name back in 93 from a little stream that runs through town. The cow pushers said that the cows used to hurt their legs when they crossed it. Two of them cow pushers, Bennett and Myers, laid out this whole town, sold the lots. The whole burg grew up around just two main streets. Bennett Avenue, where the main business was, and Myers Avenue, a block south, which was where my kind of business was carried on. Some people say that I'm to blame for one of the hottest times this town ever had back in 1896. They think that me and Jack got a, oh, well, a, a little out of hand and knocked over a gasoline stove while well, the whole town went up in flames. My place, Fat Sally's place next door, and pretty soon the whole lower end of town was gone. Five days later, another fire started and burned down most of what was left. I thought Cripple Creek was gone for good. But we're pretty tough up here and we built it all over again. This time out of bricks. And if you think business was good before the fires, you should have seen it afterwards. And people say it was the railroads that brought boom times to Cripple Creek. We had three railroads. And one time, 58 trains came in here in one day. The narrow gauge Florence and Cripple Creek line got here first in July of 1894. It climbed 5,000 feet and 40 miles of steep grades. One of my customers told me that the line paid for itself in a year. A new two-foot gauge excursion railroad travels over the roadbed of the old Cripple Creek to Victor route. Passengers get a narrated tour of the old mining district. The Midland came into Cripple Creek for 50 years, starting in December of 1895. The Midlands' big three-story brick depot is a museum now. In April of 1901, the third railroad, the short line, came into town, and it was standard gauge, too. In 1900, Cripple Creek was booming. We had 40 assay offices, 90 lawyers, 14 newspapers, 34 churches, and 25 schools, and 139 saloons. Oh, and one undertaker who really had his hands full. And my business? <laughs> well, uh, I should have been triplets. But things changed. Now most of the doctors are gone, and the assay business is real slow, and the saloons have got a different kind of customer tourists. Lots of our fancy brick buildings are still here, and you can still see some of the old railroad grades. 
One scenic highway uses the roadbed and tunnels of the old Florence and Cripple Creek Railroad. The excursion train brings back memories of the old days, my days, when everybody had gold fever and the railroad men were the kings of the mountains. Those were the good times. The chug of the engine, the clatter of the wheels, the scream of the whistle, and you're carried up to the Cripple Creek of yesterday. Crowded saloons, everybody laughing, but lots of fun. I hear that tinkly piano? Nice, ain't it? it? Brings back memories of the old days. Hello, stranger. Want some company? Of all the spectacular stretches of mountain railroads ever built in Colorado, probably the most famous is the 45 miles of track between Durango and Silverton. From the beginning, General Palmer's Silverton branch was different from other lines, partly because of the handsome, rugged country in which it was located. Here in the San Juan region, there was glorious mountain and canyon scenery. Nearby were the fabled lost cities of Mesa Verde and the exotic cultures of the Utes and the Navajos. And as the appealing centerpiece of this endlessly dramatic country, there was the exciting narrow-gauge railroad that ran between Durango and Silverton. Before the end of the 19th century, Easterners and Europeans alike were captivated by the romance of the Far West. And here, they were sure, was where that romance could be found. Almost certainly, most visitors today feel precisely the same way. Over a century ago in 1881, General Palmer and his Denver and Rio Grande completed the first tracks into the new town of Durango. The depot here is exactly 541 miles from the DNRG's origins in downtown Denver. Now, more than a century after the original tracks were put down, passengers who make this exhilarating trip are traveling an adventure-filled route into America's past. But for the men who built the line, this was a perilous path where every yard of new track seemed to bring them closer to calamity. Between Durango and Silverton, Palmer's construction crews faced 45 miles of engineering challenges as great as any yet overcome. When work began on the tracks heading north from Durango, the route aimed straight for the granite heart of the San Juans. The first few miles of construction were in flat country, and the work was relatively easy. Here, there was little hint of the ordeals that lay ahead.
Ten or so miles out of Durango, the climb began in earnest. November 1881, the tracks reached Rockwood, a little over 17 miles north of the Durango Depot. Here things began to get tough. The famous Rockwood Cut was only a preview. A high barrier of red rock separates Rockwood from the deep, rugged gorge of the Animas River. The railroad's drillers and blasters were busy all winter, gouging a cut through the barrier. The cut ended at a cliff, a wall of rock stretching upward to the sky with a sheer drop of hundreds of feet to the river below. It was clear that a shelf would have to be blasted across the face of the cliff. The construction gangs, hearts in their throats, edged out over the gorge and began their dangerous work. This stretch of track across the face of the cliff, known then and now as the High Line, is still the greatest thrill on the journey to Silverton and one of the most exciting experiences in all of railroading. Passengers today still shrink back from the right side of the car and the straight drop down to the white water of the Animas River. That's a short form of the name, by the way. In full, it's Rio de las Animas Perdidas, the River of Lost Souls. By the spring of 1882, the long shelf of the High Line had been extended until the roadbed was at river level. From that point on, the DNRG surveyors had determined that the track should follow the river's edge for the remaining 27 miles up the gorge to Silverton. Technical difficulties still lay ahead, but nothing as life-threatening as the High Line. The railroad reached Silverton in late July 1882, and within days, the first trainloads of ore were heading south to the new smelter at Durango. The bonanza that tourism provided saved General Palmer Silverton branch from bankruptcy. And ever since, the enthusiasm of generations of tourists has kept the line flourishing. Today's visitors to Silverton are able to see many historic old buildings that date from the boom years of the nearby mines. The town has changed, of course, but much of its 19th century flavor is still evident. Tourism in the San Juan region was promoted by another visionary equal to General Palmer, Otto Mears, posing here with two Ute Indian chiefs. Mears, called the Pathfinder of the San Juans, built or acquired three small narrow gauge lines that connected Silverton with a number of higher, more remote mining camps. This was hard, demanding country up here, where even the DNRG feared to tread. In 1892, Mears completed a fourth line, the Rio Grande Southern. 
175 miles of narrow gauge track running from Durango to Ridgeway. The train took tourists close to Mesa Verde, chugged through the fertile Montezuma Valley to Dolores, and on still deeper into the mountains. In addition to passenger service, livestock, ore, and timber were carried out to Durango in connections with the DNRG. When the Panic of 1893 hit the Silver Country, Otto Mears's little Rio Grande Southern went into receivership and was placed under the management of the DNRG. In 1921, the DNRG merged to become the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad. The standard gauge managers of the new company appeared to have no interest in their narrow gauge lines. But during the depression of the 1930s, the DNRG in this area achieved further fame as the home of the ungainly but practical and fascinating Galloping Goose. These stalwart vehicles, which seem more than a trifle makeshift to us today, helped the narrow gauge lines to survive for a few years longer. Then in 1942, when all of these lines but the Durango Silverton were eliminated, Otto Mears' four wonderful railroads vanished. Although the states of Colorado and New Mexico rescued the old DNRG track from Antonito to Chama, the rest of the line from Chama to Durango was scrapped. But the Silverton branch was saved by a fact that even the most dedicated standard gauge manager could not ignore. It was profitable. People loved it. Visitors flocked here by the thousands to ride the High Line. Charles E. Bradshaw, Jr. bought the Silverton branch in 1981. He brought in large locomotives from the DNRG yard in Alamosa and rebuilt them. He refurbished antique stock that had begun to deteriorate. He rebuilt the roadbed and laid new rail to support heavier engines and longer trains. Even more important for lovers of old-time railroads, Bradshaw announced that the newly renamed Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad would be a model of historical accuracy. The trip was not going to be just a nice ride on a quaint old train. It was a chance to see and feel the past brought authentically to life. This is where you can travel into the wilderness. Hear the wail of the train whistle and the clack of the wheels. Feel the rhythmic sway of the cars and the steady tug of the incredible steel giant up ahead. Smell the perfume of coal smoke blowing past on the bright mountain air. This is the country. This is the life of the real old-time railroad men. And wherever they may be, this is what they want us to remember.